Hi everyone, so it's 6.01 and I guess we'll get started. Uh, I want to start off by saying thank you for joining our session on um, to learn more about what people are doing with their money. And today's session will be co-hosted by myself and Nidia and we have our special guests, Carla, Haruka, and uh, Eric that you'll be hearing from. So uh, I'll start off by introducing who we are. So this session is, co uh, is a collaboration between the Global Shapers Ottawa Hub and Zala Smart. So the Global Shapers are a community. Uh, it's a network of young people driving uh, dialogue, action, and change. Um, we have over 450 hubs across the world. So we are a global network and uh, we do two key things. So one thing is working on local projects that help improve the state of our city. So for example, this is our financial literacy series. Um, it's our last one this month. We've had four so far and uh, we hope that by people joining them, we can create impact as they learn more about money. Uh, and Zala Smart, I'm actually the founder of an organization called Zala Smart, and we teach kids and teens between the ages of 5 to 17 the essential life skill financial literacy. And this is actually our first time working um, uh, with the Global Shapers to do something for young professionals that are eager to learn more about money. So I'll hand it over to Media to take it from here. Oh, okay. We may have lost media, which is okay. So I, I guess I'll just continue on. Uh, so I would love for our special guests to introduce themselves. Uh, let's start with Carla. Thank you, Zala. Uh, so my name is Carla. I'm a um, marketing, um, a digital marketing. So I'm a content strategist for the Telford School of Management. And I went back to school about two years ago uh, to under our I guess almost two years ago to undertake my uh, MBA. So I'm both a full-time employee and an MBA student at the same time right now. Uh, and uh, yeah, I didn't have really a lot of knowledge about um, you know, how to handle my own financials. It's always something that when I was growing up, I gave to my dad uh, to kind of take care of for me. And then uh, once I was on my own, I, I, I had you know my husband that I kind of took took care of that for me. And it's only recently that I, I kind of just went into it and, and started to learn a lot more, um, both because I, I you know, wanted to, at some point, be able to purchase a house. So that was, I guess, the first thing. And then second thing is uh, going back to school and actually studying uh, a, a part of that. And uh, yeah, so I'm excited to learn from people who actually do it for a living and, and who um, you know, have all of their experiences. So that's kind of why I'm here. Thank you, Carla. Uh, Eric, would you like to go next? Yeah, for sure. So I'm Eric. I'm currently studying the, um, engineering science at the University of Toronto. So currently just finished junior year. Um, I'm interning for this entire year. Um, so proceeding into senior year later on 2021. Um, for me, I specialize in machine intelligence, so artificial intelligence um, software is my realm. Um, so currently, I intern at a software startup within Toronto, working remotely now. So uh, COVID changes plans a little bit, um, so generally in the tech industry. Um, for me, personal finance has always been something that I've been getting more into, especially now interning a little bit more and making some money. So obviously hoping to have it actually do something uh, with the money versus just it's sitting there in the account. and not doing anything, of course. Um, and of course, personal finance later on for me will be very important, especially when um, considering buying a house or moving or trying to budget. So for me, I'm super excited to be to take part of this um, and giving that, I guess, student perspective uh, on money. Thank you. We're happy to have you both here. Uh, Haruka, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself. You're muted. You'll have to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. There you go. There we go. Uh, hi, I'm Haruka. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm a member of the Global Shapers, the Ottawa Hub. Uh, 
my day job currently. I'm a director of finance uh, at a small tech company called Kibuto Solutions here in Ottawa. Um, for, by, by profession, I'm a CPA CA. Um, and I graduated university in 2013 from Carleton University and um, you know, went down the business stream obviously and did a, a accounting and finance degree. Um, so in theory, I should know a lot of this, but in practice in my personal life, it's been a, it's, it's been a journey of, of learning over the years, but uh, yeah, excited to kind of share, share my thoughts and learn from everyone else as well. This is awesome. So we've got a pretty awesome panel from student to young professional to someone with a bit more experience in their career. So I'm excited to hear from all of you and what you're doing with your money. Uh, I'll hand it over to media to kind of share more about what this session's about and then we could jump into our questions. Amazing. Thank you very much, Tekla. Um, I apologize, everyone. My connection here is really bad. So I'm joining from my phone. Um, so as Tekla mentioned, this is the Financial Literacy Month and we wanted to create an event to help us all gain experience and knowledge and actually better managing personal finance. So we started first with actually having an event about uh, the basics and the fundamentals of financial literacy. Uh, then we talked about budgeting and how to actually budget your money and to think about credit and debt management. Um, then we did an event on uh, the kind of an overview and saving and what we can do to save money and investment. Um, and today's session is to sum summarize everything that we have talked about and actually uh, provide that learning opportunity where we can all learn together from different individuals and from each other um, how to better manage personal finance. So this session is meant to be an interactive session. Uh, we will start by asking the speakers some general questions and general ideas and then we will open up the floors for Q&A. You're always more than welcome to add any question, any comment in the chat box and if you have any specific question to a specific speaker you can also address that in your comment. Um, but I guess now it's a good time for us to start with our questions. Um, so the, the first question that we have, let me hope my questions will load, given the fact that my Wi-Fi shut down now. <laughs> um, so the first question I have is, when did you first learn about the importance of financial literacy? So this question, just to kind of give you an idea of when was that moment in your life that you felt that you should learn better on how to manage personal finance. Um, and Carla, do you want to start first? Absolutely. Um, I guess for me, it hasn't been that long ago. It's, it's um, I would probably even say like, like September of last year, um, when, uh, so me and my husband used to work, live in this really tiny apartment and, um, you know, we, we had been thinking about buying a house for a while, uh, but everything was just so expensive and it just felt so out of reach. And I think that's when I was just like, there, there has to be something that I don't understand. There has to be some way that people can do this because if we both have a job, if we're both working hard, like I don't understand that we can't buy a house. Like to me, that just didn't make any sense. And I guess that's, that's when I was just, I, I guess I had enough of putting my head or I guess keeping my head in the sand because I, I feel like I knew that there were things I could do. I just wasn't interested really in looking for them and understanding what they were. Um, so for me, I think that that was that, that aha moment of, well, if I actually want this as a life goal, then I need to put in the work and I need to figure out um, where to start. And, and really it was about where to start uh, and, and for me, that's, that's the first time of making an appointment with my bank um, of, of just like, okay, I, what do I have to do? So that, yeah, for me, that, that's so really about like just a little over a year ago, I would say, and yeah, I'm going to be 30. So that's amazing, Carlos. Thank you. No, I think many of us can relate to this in the sense that we have that woke up call when we want to do something new in life and we notice that we don't really have the capability or even the knowledge to know how to finance it, to manage it. That's uh, 
very nice of you to share. Thank you very much, yeah, Carla. Yeah, adulting, adulting yeah. is the word. <laughs> yeah, work in progress. <laughs> Hiroka, would you like to tell us or share with us when was that moment when you realized the importance of financial literacy? Yes, for sure. Um, so <laughs> for me, you know, um, I was, you know, I went to university to, to do my Bachelor of Commerce. So kind of learning all this stuff indirectly. Uh, but I think it really hit home for me when I got my co-op internship, which started right after my second year. So uh, at the start of my third year, basically working full time for eight months and first time really making a consistent kind of paycheck and you know your first job your all these different forms you have to sign you know like your benefits what do you want there's a RSP matching like you know what do you want to do and I just so it's so overwhelmed by just the paperwork on top of just getting into a job that was pretty demanding and you know you're just trying to prove yourself so I was like okay just put that stuff aside for a second just focus on your job only realizing after you know that's 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 some important stuff in that paperwork right so made a lot of tiny mistakes that you learn from over 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 uh, over time and one of them was the RSP matching right I didn't take that too seriously I waited like till halfway through my co-op term only to realize oh if I had signed this and got this out the way right away I could have all this other money that was going to come to me anyway if I just signed this paperwork so um it really my first co-op internship was when I really had to uh, allocate, you know, this money that was coming in, what do I want to do it? Because like you said, if you don't, you just kind of end up spending it here or there, or it's sitting in your bank account, and there's no real purpose behind it. Um, so that's what really got me thinking. And again, yeah, I think there's some milestones every, every in every stage of your life. And I bought my house. Um, that was uh, a point where I was like, okay, I really have to be rock solid on my budget. Otherwise, you know, you may not, you may, you may, turn into being a house poor, right? Where like all your money is going towards it, you're not factoring in all your expenses for, uh, for your living and whatnot. So yeah, it's uh, it started in university and then through all these kind of major life events, you kind of recalibrate and refocus. That's been my story. Amazing, thank you very much, Hiroka. It seems yeah. like both milestones and mistakes are the best teacher for financial, financial literacy. Um, Eric, what about you as a student and uh, you're starting your kind of professional journey? Has there been a moment in your life where you, you realize the importance of financial literacy? Yeah, for sure. So I guess I'm in a similar boat as uh, Haruka in the sense of after my first internship, which was a research position. Um, so pay wasn't super high, but it was paid nonetheless, um, which was in first year. So about three years ago, um, of course, before that, I didn't really work or at least didn't have a reliable source of income. So at that point, now having a consistent stream of income, um, for me, I always thought, hey, um, I'm not going to spend all this because I've never been um, a really big spender in anything. Um, so it was just kind of building up and I didn't really know what to do with it. So that's kind of when I went on my little YouTube binge. Um, so where it was cat videos previously, it was replaced with more financial literacy things. So clicking around on YouTube and seeing different words pop up of interest rates or um, investments, mortgages, or different things just come up. Um, retirement funds show, it kind of broadened my scope in a sense where it was kind of like a dose of reality where, yeah, money is important. Um, and this is something that'll be increasingly as important as there's kind of bigger milestones and more milestones in life. So with that thought, I kind of gradually descended into more uh, financial literacy and being more aware with money and personal finance. So for me, it's definitely been kind of that sudden spark and the gradual climb with kind of seeing more uh, different material, um, different content, and then realizing on my own as I kind of am a little bit more aware of my spending habits and stuff like that, um, eventually kind of being more and more into financial literacy. This is wonderful. Thank you, Eric. I, I do remember um, la early last year, I also went on YouTube and LinkedIn learning binge to actually learn the basics. And I took so much notes and I went to talk to my financial advisor and I took my notes with me <laughs> to make sure that I actually remember at least the terminology. Uh, but your answer actually Eric, takes to kind of a great segue to our next question, um, which is how, what resources that you use to build your financial literacy skill, if it was through a friend, school, family or external resources. So like you did mention the fact that you went in a YouTube binge, but are there any other resources that have helped you kind of gain some of that knowledge? Mm -hmm. So for sure, definitely 
YouTube has been the starting source, um, not 100% of my sources, but has been a starting source in terms of inspiration and getting kind of um, quick terminology up. Um, for me, I guess, in a technical major, I didn't have, I guess, the luxury of being um, more related to business. So for me, school wasn't really facet there other than maybe some school clubs. I kind of jumped in here and there. I feel like for me, it's been really offset by um, YouTube, which is kind of the basis. I've been reading more books. So definitely reading different books. I'm definitely brought in my perspective um, more where I could kind of take more notes. I could do highlights in them. Um, just things that I could um, really establish myself at least in having a, like a value basis for let's say financial literacy. Um, and then slowly building that up through maybe talking to friends who are also starting to do internships. So kind of bouncing off ideas off of them. Um, and then also with my parents where I could actually ask them about certain things with things like rent or owning a house or different things like that, things that I'll do in the future. So it's been a gradual climb of really self-learning through YouTube books and then eventually talking to more people, friends, parents, uh, people more experienced. Thank you very much for sharing with us, Egg. How about you, Carlo? How do you do you have any other resources that have helped you gain some of you know the fundamental knowledge or to build better kind of habits in terms of personal finance? Yeah, well, I think once I decided to take the blinders off, because, you know, like, like before, um, before, I guess, last September, I was really, um, I knew it was there, I didn't want to look at it, it felt complicated, my previous jobs, we had accountant services that literally, like, for even like, filing our taxes, we could pay the $80 and they would take care of everything and then kind of give it back. And I had that very hands off approach of because I didn't understand it, I was so scared of it. Um, but then I started, yeah, so when, when I decided to, you know, at some point I want to purchase a house, uh, I went to the bank and, and got some advice and the advice that I was given felt, felt very salesy. And I felt like I went, like, I, I, I didn't, not that I didn't trust it, but to me, it felt like it didn't feel right. And then that's when I, I, you know, and I took notes at the bank. I was just like, okay, we'll say that again. And what does this mean? And then I just started asking a lot of questions, uh, which they didn't seem to expect, which was interesting. I think at the bank, they're very used to telling people kind of what to do. And um, they didn't have a lot of the answers that I was having and, and they were showing me uh, potential, you know, mutual funds that I could be investing in and things like that. And then I asked about, well, are, do you have any um, like social, socially responsible funds or anything of that nature that, um, you know, if I don't want to invest in, uh, in energy or mining or things like that, like what are my options if I do funds? And then they're like, well, we don't really have those portfolios and, and questions like that. And I'm like, well, that's, that's weird. Like we're in 2019 back then. I'm like, these things, people know that they exist. So why does um, my bank not have this? And then I went online and then I, I found uh, Wealth Simple, which um, completely changed my life, I would say. So on there, there's like a whole bunch of blogs. It, it kind of explains the differences between types of funds. It explains, um, you know, the, the, the RRSPs and the uh, direct investments and things like that. And just reading through it, I'm like, oh my gosh, my bank has kind of been, they haven't actually been managing my money. Like I've been making less than inflation at the bank, which made no sense. So I'm like, all of this time, I could have been earning so much more interest on the money that I already had, even though it wasn't a lot. Um, well, that interest over time builds up and then it, that's how you, you end up growing. And all of these things, I guess, was just an aha moment for me. And, and um, yeah, so wealth simple, but then I got super interested. And then at the same time, uh, you know, my husband was also bringing up on, on this and then it, it actually became an interest of ours where we discussed it and, and almost like a conversation of like, oh, well, I found this out. But like, oh yeah, well, I found this out. And then just through talking um, and trying to one up each other, we got really good at understanding, um, I guess, personal finance. And we ended up not doing like almost nothing with the bank and, and kind of going our own route. 
um, and doing a lot of investments through uh, the simple, you know, Wealth Simple. It's an app, by the way, if you guys don't have it, like I really recommend it. And because it allows you to even just play around with small amounts of money. Um, and then you can see it grow. You can see what that projected value is going to be in the future if you maintain, um, you know, automatic contributions. You can do weekly top ups. Uh, so, whatever, you know, uh, it, it rounds the dollar on your credit card purchases and then all of those roundups get sent to that 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 account so for you it's it's pennies it's it's not something that really makes a difference but in the long run it actually does make a difference so um yeah best best tool for me definitely has been wealth simple and then just talking and then through talking finding new sources of information and and yeah just uh also school in my mba um uh i would say Fortunately, but also unfortunately, I do have finance, uh, a finance class that which is for a marketing person, probably uh, the least interesting or most difficult class that I've had to do so far in the MBA. Um, so, so it's a lot of work and, and it's, it's very, very technical when you look at it, like in terms of corporate finance. Uh, but then that also just adds a lot of information for, for stocks and, and if people are interested in purchasing stocks and what does that mean and what's the difference between stocks that issue dividends and stocks that don't. And, and yeah, so it, there's a wealth of information and it's just about talking and opening up a new door and if you're interested then go in it and if not there's going to be 10 other doors anyway so it's kind of been a very non-linear strategy i guess no this is amazing carla thank you you know very much i i took some mental notes and stuff that i did not know about and i was always hesitant to use wealth simple but now you kind of encourage me to try it so thank yeah. you for that um Hiroka, what about you have you used any resources outside school, given the fact that you might be the finance yeah. expert in this call? No, I, I resonated with, uh, with the points made by both uh, Eric and Carla. I, I think for me, it's, it's three things, right? So it's like your self-learning, um, you know, YouTube, the Wealth Simple blogs are, are pretty, pretty awesome as well. Uh, it's part of that self-learning. There's two books that I read that were really useful to me. I think useful to anyone who's trying to go into like the financial literacy, expand their knowledge. One is um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Karyosaki. So I just think this is a good book just to get your perspective on how you can make money work for you and, and how to just change your framework of, of how you think of money uh, in, in uh, its relationship to your life. And then the other one that I, um, that I read that I thought was really great was um, I Will Teach You To Be Rich by Ramit Sethi. I, I don't like the title, it's a bit, but very very practical kind of things down to even like your credit cards right like what does it mean if you're making minimum payments versus paying it off and, and interest and just very practical um advice uh on on how to manage your finances so uh, self-learning was a big part of it youtube um I, I was just saying before this call i was looking at a lot of ben felix who was our speaker in our first session a lot of his videos is useful uh, and then self-learning. So when I was in university, I was taking all these finance classes. I was personally, I wasn't confident enough to like just put my money and start investing uh, at that time. So I actually went on Investopedia. You can do like a simulation. You can simulate, you know, however much money you have and, and you can trade real stocks and see how you're doing and how you're performing. And I thought that was a great tool to just learn, um, how to invest your money though you shouldn't invest in individual stocks too much we'll get into that later but if you if you just want to understand how everything works in the stock market and want to play around but not with your real money just you know just playing around in a in a stock simulator with real world data that was really useful for me and then the third thing was just really reaching out to people who i trusted and respected were uh, mentors uh, or, or close friends and just asking them like hey how do you how do you manage your money? How do you budget, right? These are conversations that, I mean, a lot of people put a thought about um, within themselves, but it's not conversations that are openly discussed, right? Uh, so for me, talking to my friends has been very insightful uh, for me personally. You know, I, I have some friends who budget, who have, they budget their money so intensely, they model out how many coffees they drink a day and how much that costs. And uh, and 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 project out how much they should be spending on coffee, and I'm like, this is insane. 
but I have someone who does that and then some, someone else who just ballparks, you know, they look at their credit card uh, statements here, there, and then they're like, I, I, know, I know what I'm spending. And, you know, so you just see the degree of how people manage their money, what they use. And then from there, you pick up little tips and tricks. So uh, I, I would recommend that to anyone to just, just reach out to folks who, um, you know, good friends or mentors who you, who you think uh, have a bit more confidence in financial literacy and just, just hear them out on what they do. I think that you, you learn quite a bit from that. Thank you very much, Hiroka. Seems like the YouTube Academy is our at least common foundation for all of us. So this is amazing. Um, you actually talked briefly about reaching out to friends and asking for advice. So I'm just wondering for Hiroka, uh, Carla, and Eric, if any of you have received any specific advice or suggestion that helped you really change your views about personal finance and managing personal finance and if you can't think of anything else, it's not a problem. I, I can jump in if, uh, oh, yeah. yeah for, for me, it was the budgeting process. So I tried a whole bunch of tools and I can talk about them later, but I ended up coming back to just, just having everything on Excel, like in terms of tracking what I'm spending per month. I, I, you have great tools like Mint, com or um, YNAB that automatically can connect to your bank account and show you what you're spending and you just have to you know categorize what your things are but I found just I talked to some friends and how meticulous they were about their tracking their expenditure and I thought it was an extreme but then I tried it out and then I realized it was just just the act of me doing it on a weekly basis even though it may be a bit more time consuming it makes me um much more connected and fully aware of what's going on in my finances on a on a weekly basis, at least, uh, and how how I'm tracking against uh, goals uh, or budgets, right? And then the other big thing I learned um, just through my friends, and then over time, just by doing it, just just automating, just automating everything. So you know, just because you're caught up in work or you have a major life event, and doesn't mean that you miss your phone payment or your internet payment or whatnot. Right, and that all that stuff kind of just gets taken care of. Um, so it's a less of a headache for you when you think of financial literacy. It's it's uh, you don't have to think about a hundred different things, but just just a little bit less than that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, for me, it's, it's I guess very similar to you, and and uh, um, I guess the 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 one thing and the automation part is is so true. Um, the, the, I think the minute that we started doing that for both saving and paying off bills, and I think the saving part was like automating that um, at the same level of, of paying off bills, we, it, it made it so that because we didn't even have access to that money because it was getting placed already, um, that's not something that we were thinking of saving. So our budgeting um, was a little bit, I guess, different because we weren't deciding how much money to spend on what on, on what things it was well how much money do we have left because everything that we needed to take care of is already taken care of and I guess that that's what we get to play with and as long as those amounts were comfortable um, to say well this is what we have left because um, I know for a fact that I would have a very hard time doing the excel spreadsheet I would have you know, I, I, I know that that's not something that I can do. I'm not there yet in my adulting. Um, but at least to know that everything is taken care of. And if, if I have a little bit of surplus, you know, then I will spend it. But it, I guess the last year has been, if, if, if there was one positive for, for me at, at the very least in, in the confinement and then not going anywhere and um, also being school and uh, work at the same time is that I didn't have time for a social life or to do activities. All the money that I made, I was able to kind of save right away. And, um, and maybe that's a good thing. I think, may, I think I needed that. I think I was so used to kind of living paycheck to paycheck beforehand of, uh, oh, well, this money needs to be for rent or this, and then going out with friends and not really thinking about it. Um, that it's, a, it's almost like being confined to stay at home uh, even before the pandemic actually started in my case, because I just had too much homework and too much school and work at the same time that just not going out, uh, took all of like a lot of those expenses out. And that's when I'm like, oh my gosh, 
I was spending a lot of money on things that I didn't need or things that I could have made at home, like coffee, like um, I, I work at the University of Ottawa. We have a Starbucks like right down our office. And if you think about it, if you're spending like $5, you know, at, even once a day, that's so much money at the end of the year. Uh, but then sometimes, you know, you would do it between classes and then it's like two coffees, three coffees, and that really just adds up. So, um, yeah, not being able to go out was a really good thing and in, in being able to save up that, 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 that money for us anyway, to, that we needed to, to get going on our uh, home ownership journey, I guess. I resonate with that. The coffees that was the, you know, once you start tracking things and you look at your line for like, I, I had to just be like, whoa, that's that's a way more money than you think. Because psychologically, you're like, oh, it's just like three bucks. It's just two fifty, right? But when you do that over time, uh, it gets pretty expensive. Yeah. 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 Coffee. Coffee is always one of them. I mean, there's also a <laughs> bunch of alternatives. I think always for me, it's always been um, one thing. Automation. Definitely agree with. Automation is something so awesome that makes it so much easier. Um, especially that helps you develop the habit too, right? So maybe initially you do it manually to develop that habit and then you switch to automation. So you kind of know what's actually going on versus it being a black box and it's just, okay, I see this. I don't know what happened, but I see that, you know? So um, for me, it's always really been building the habit of getting used to financial literacy, um, talking about budget budgeting, kind of having that self spreadsheet, but now also converting to Mint now too. So now being able to track cash flow and things like that. Um, and then when tracking all those things kind of makes you think about coffee because you see like on a pie chart or whatever your expenses you see wow I spent a hundred dollars on coffee or something um, especially if it's like downtown Toronto coffee which could be very expensive um, so especially seeing everything kind of happen you kind of develop like more habits of course and then better perspectives and seeing different alternatives right like instead of five dollar coffee there's 20 cent coffee that isn't that much worse right so um, is really building those habits um, using the automation, using tools that's disposable, that's available to you, um, and really proceeding from there to, like, I guess, make judgments as you go later on in life. This is very interesting, actually. I received an advice recently from a friend who I think does budgeting phenomenally, but I would not, just felt too much work to, for me, where they, every time they receive a paycheck, they actually had different accounts for different things, including rent, phone bill, uh, life expenses, and get automatically divided between them. Whatever they have left in their account is what they can use. Uh, just felt like such a, an extreme work. And I, I did the reverse mechanism where I actually printed off um, my credit card statement for like multiple months. And I you know, saw the percentage of where I'm spending. And luckily it turns out that I'm not spending, I thought my spending habits were horrible, but they were not as bad. So at least I learned something about myself after going through um, my statement and actually analyzing them. So it's definitely investing that time to, to understand your own, you know, spending habits makes a huge difference. Um, and maybe that fear, media, like if I can just add to that, that fear of thinking that you're so bad, that what you were already doing was so bad. Like I had that too. And I think it was preventing me from wanting to look into it because I didn't want to feel bad about myself. And, and it's, it's almost psychological. It's, it's almost like it's something that you know is there, but you don't want to look because it's, it's about you really, because it's about your own spending habits. It's about what you, um, you choose to do. And, but I too was surprised that when you actually look at it, it's some things I was like, oh my God, that's ridiculous. And I have to stuff that out. But there's also a lot of stuff that it's like, no, it's, it's, things cost money and some things like when you do the exercise of like what can you actually cut off um well you know I think everyone's going to be surprised that some things that you can cut off but then there's also a lot of stuff that's that's just what life is like these things are expensive and, and that's okay too but being able to get beyond that fear to even have a look is such a big step um, and I personally was so scared to take it because I just thought I was the worst. Yep. No, I understand. I completely agree with you. And even to me to just go talk to my kind of bank advisor 
on different accounts and different things. I was so nervous even going because I just, I did not even know the basic terminology. And people use lots of acronym all the time and they throw them at you. And I'm like, I do not know what any of this means. Um, so even spending that time to understand my own habits and learning a little bit just enough to get over a conversation and not to be shy to ask questions, <laughs> that definitely made a huge difference for me. Um, so actually now, I think all of you touched briefly on actually investment. And I'm just curious to see if you guys invest money and how do you invest money? Um, Eric, do you wanna go first to share with us on if you invest money and if you do, how do you invest money? Yeah, for sure. So for me, investments, I think I split between, no interest rate. interest rates are a bit low, but um, I usually split between, I guess, two types of investments. One's more just like um, stocks. So it's all my stocks. And then one, I usually just put in like a high interest savings account. So those are more for like emergency funds, not necessarily investment, um, but before it was high interest rates. So um, get some compound, compound growth in there. Um, but then for stocks for me is usually a lot of indices um, as well as just a diversified portfolio. Um, so I guess that's usually my main investments. Um, I don't really do anything super risky in terms of, let's say, stocks. Um, maybe like my most riskiest would be some growth stocks that I purchased really early on. Um, but for me, I don't really play super risky. Um, but yeah, I guess my, those are generally my investments. I feel um, they could kind of be common, at least around, among my friends, but yeah. And, and do you do the investment through your bank or do you use mm -hmm. other platforms for investment? Yeah, so I do my um, investments through my brokerage account, through the bank, just because I guess, I know Wealth Simple, there is a, I think zero, zero dollar trading fee or something like that, commissions. For me, since I don't trade as often, um, for me, it's usually like on major, like let's say report earnings or any opportunities, like a major dip or something, then I would purchase or go in um, or just accumulation purchases over, let's say three months. Um, so for me, I usually just go through brokerage and then not have to deal with different accounts through like different organizations. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, how about you, Hiroka? Um, kind of similar to Eric, except maybe maybe my investments in, in growth uh, stocks and stuff is maybe a bit, bit, uh, bit a, a big, uh, a bit larger of a percentage of, of my pie. Um, but overall, yeah, I use Questrade for my investments. I actually just, uh, you know, I heard so, so many good things about Wealth Simple. I just put a bit of money there just to see how it works. And I think Wealth Simple is awesome, uh, you know, going with, going on these conversations about people who overwhelmed with, you know, what this means, what that means. Uh, uh, if you haven't checked it out, uh, I, I literally did this a couple of weeks ago where, you know, it's very, very simple in terms of you answer a bunch of questions that, Help you help them identify your risk threshold, and then they will kind of based on your timeline, your goals, they'll make um, uh, investments on your behalf. Uh, and really, you don't have to think of it beyond that, which is pretty neat. But um, most of my portfolio and my investments are in Quest Trade, which is another kind of brokerage um, firm outside of the banks. But uh, yeah, a lot of a um, lot of index funds, which is basically you're buying. You're, you're buying kind of the whole, if you're buying like an index fund of the S&P 500, you're buying um, the weighted shares of those, all those companies within there. Um, so a lot of that, and then a certain portion um, in growth related stocks. But again, that really depends on your uh, appetite for risk uh, and, and what your goals are, your short term or long term, uh, all those things kind of play a part in terms of how you want to invest. Yeah. Thank you. Um, how about you, Carla? Um, yeah, so I, um, so for me, I, I used to have uh, my RRSP account and a TFSA account that was open with the bank. And for the longest time, it was just kind of sitting there and, and the bank had told me I could get this great interest rate in a GIC that was kind of locked in for however many years and it was literally just sitting there and even though they had told me oh yeah this is a great interest rate um it it, it wasn't when I realized that there were so many uh other opportunities outside of the bank or outside of I guess the GIC and for people who don't know like those are kind of it, it's secure money right so it, it it doesn't have a high risk and that's why um, the interest rates are usually really low with those types um, of investments. But 
I was like, no, I, I need to grow this. I don't like, I'm young. I can take the risk on now because, um, you know, I, I can do that. So when, when I found, so when I, I looked into uh, perhaps doing more like investment portfolios, whether it was like through mutual funds or stocks or anything like that, asking at the bank, um, they were just trying to sell me these portfolios that um, didn't really align with my values at all. And that's how I, I discovered Wealth Simple. And I literally moved all of my money to, um, to Wealth Simple, and I opened, uh, so like my RRSP was just converted to uh, RRSP account, Wealth Simple paid back the fees uh, to the bank uh, that I had to do that. So for me, it was a seamless thing, like you put in the information, they contact the bank for you, it migrates all of your money uh, there. And then what I loved about this is that you can see your future growth. They have a super simple, um, I mean, it's called Wealth Simple, but you, you see um, the, the UI is made, like the user experience is so easy for you to see this, if this is how much you're gonna be putting in each month by year six, by age 65, this is how much you'll have in this account. Um, and, and uh, you know, like her, uh, Haruka said, you, you get to decide the, the risk level. And for me, I, I even chose to go with uh, socially responsible portfolios. Uh, so I know I'm not getting any uh, get like, like gas and, and things that I, that don't align with my values. So that was very cool. So that, I guess was, that was step one for my investments. Uh, and then the, the, the difference also understanding the difference between an RRSP account, which, um, the government gives you back a tax credit for the amount of, well, it doesn't, it's not so much a tax credit, but the money that you put into that account, you're only going to be taxed, uh, on, on that portion of income that you put in once you retire. Um, so that means that at the end of the year, they kind of give you back that portion that you would have been spending on taxes. You get to keep it and invest that as well um, if you can. So understanding that you could grow your money like that faster now um, was super cool. And then the other one was the TFSA, so the tax-free savings account. So those accounts are also any type of investments account that you can put your money in and any interest that is earned, um, you're not taxed, uh, on that interest. So, um, so of course there's a cap for how much you're allowed to invest in both of those accounts per year. But for me, I'm nowhere near reaching that cap. Um, so, so I'm just, you know, kind of like putting it in as much as I can, um, with, with what we have, but that kind of was my early strategy to, to invest was just, okay, what is out there? What's the difference between the two? So I, I do both. I have a TFSA that's, um, you know, more like just my my day to day, like that we get to kind of keep that. Um, if there is an emergency, like we can kind of pull that out. Uh, but then my RRSP, which we actually used uh, to buy to buy our first house, so we we used uh, the government's um, first home purchasers plan, uh, where you're allowed to pull uh, thirty five thousand dollars from your RRSP account, uh, and then you have to pay it back over a period of ten years. Uh, but that for us, that that was amazing um, because we had been already kind of putting money uh, in, in that account previously. So that was a, a big thing. And then I, I also opened because Wealth Simple has both. It has the investment and then it has like the T, uh, TFSAs and RSPs, but the investments account, like the stock tradings accounts. And I think that's what Eric was talking about. Um, so those ones have zero commission and they don't have all of the stocks out there. So if you're looking at like buying Tesla stocks, you're not going to find it on Wealth Simple. Um, but there are. Um, there are some other stocks. There's a lot of Canadian companies that are on there too. And, and, and it's just interesting. So for me, I, I took that opportunity um, as a test. So I, I decided I'm going to invest $200 um, because that wasn't a big risk. And, and I, you know, the worst that can happen is that I lose all of the $200 and I was okay with that. And I just wanted to play with it. And then I started um, buying some stocks here and there. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, I bought a Zoom stock, um, you know, and, and small amounts because I only had the $200. So I could only afford what I could afford on 
on the, the app and and by by trading and selling and I grew that and uh, now so since I guess March so I started at around two hundred dollars and I've already have about seven hundred uh, dollars uh, of just growth either from you know selling and some stuff I sold and I'm like why did I do that I'll never be able to buy it again um so but it's it's through doing mistakes and and through trying things but anything that happens to that account I'm like whatever it was only two hundred dollars to start with anyway so my my appreciation for risk on that account specifically doesn't hold the same importance as it does on my RRSP and my other like TFSAs that are more like my savings accounts. Um, so yeah, so do both like play, but then, you know, also invest and save. Thank you so much, Carla. I think I'm, I'm taking so many mental notes as much as possible at almost 3 a.m. in my time zone. So <laughs> I'm, I'm learning a lot. Like I don't wanna even go back to sleep after. <laughs> so thank you all uh, for sharing. I believe I asked all of you to answer this question, but if I didn't, please jump in. Um, I know some of you have mentioned that you're all using different resources to help you manage personal finance. I know you talked about Mint or Excel sheets, but any of you use any different um, tools that you're using to help you manage finance, whether it is investment, budgeting, uh, or any, any other element? Not, I think that weren't already mentioned for me. Okay. How about you, Eric or Hilke? Any other tools that you're using? I guess for me, it's mostly just spreadsheets, Mint. Um, I guess my brokerage account, like my bank's account, those are mostly kind of everything I use. Yeah, I um, Excel Excel's a big one for me. Uh, I've kind of gone back to that after trying a bunch of things, but if if someone I'm from a, from the budgeting perspective and just keep track of your finances, um, the two I mentioned earlier, mint.com or YNAB, which stands for you need a budget. Um, they, both of them, you can manage your budget uh, and your actual spend uh, without being connected to your bank account. So you can download your transactions and upload it, or you can have it connected to your bank account. And when I say connected, it can only read your data. It doesn't, it cannot do anything else, but it's a good way if you don't have the time or you don't want to go through Excel or whatnot, it can help you uh, keep track of your spend and compare that to your budget. Um, so those are two tools that um, I've tried before that I, I think could be pretty useful to folks. Um, but uh, yeah, personally, I, I use Excel and then, um, and yeah, Questrade, I guess. But overall, whatever the tool is, I think it, it doesn't really matter. Even if it's pen and paper, I think the most important thing, especially when it comes to budgeting, is like it, what use whatever it is that helps you look at it consistently. Uh, and, and whatever consistently means to you, uh, whatever makes sense, whether it's monthly or for me, it's weekly. I just check in on my Excel and download my transactions. But that's the most important thing. If you're going to keep a, if, you, if you're going to create a budget for your year by month, but you only look at it at the end of the year, like how, how effective is it to have a budget, right? So uh, whatever tool you use, um, as long as you're, you're checking in on it con consistently and you're checking where you're at compared to your budget, because um, at the end of the day, all these tools are meant to help you uh, stay on track as, as much as you can to your budget, right? To achieve your financial goals. So I think that's the most important thing, regardless of what tools you end up uh, trying to use. Yeah, that's amazing. I actually remember downloading um, a budgeting um, Excel sheet after finishing my course at YouTube Academy. <laughs> and the, the Excel sheet was, was so de detailed that actually I found it hard to even navigate and I ended up making my own one that made sense to me. Like you said, it's just about knowing and actually being able to look back and understand what your spending habits are and how can you improve or change stuff. So thank you all for answering the questions. Um, Tekla, do you have any questions in, in the chat? I, um, on my phone, I can't really see the chat, so. Yeah, no problem. Um, we haven't received any questions. Oh wait, here, one's coming in right now. How do you keep on top of the latest news with the stocks you are invested in? Anyone would like to well, in theory, if you are uh, investing for the long term, 
you wouldn't need to care about individual stocks and uh, you wouldn't be making decisions off of short-term um, news uh, about an individual stock. But um, again, it depends, depends on what you're investing, what your time horizon is and, and what you're looking for. Um, so if you are investing in individual stocks, uh, I'd hope it's, it's for a certain time horizon as opposed to kind of day trading. I'd always recommend against that unless you're in your, you know, your $200 bucket, like Carla mentioned, then you could play around with that. Um, but um, yeah, overall, I think you should be looking for the long term and just try to understand as much as you can about the fundamental value of the company. And, and you know, if that's changing, a lot of news and speculation drives stock, the stock market and, and the price going up and down doesn't necessarily reflect the true value of a company. Uh, and that's really important to know because, um, you know, when you see stocks go up, but you see nothing has changed fundamentally in terms of what's going on with that company or whatnot. Uh, it's a good indicator that it's, it's based off of speculation and what people are presuming may happen in the future and pricing that into an individual stock. So it's important to be aware of that. Uh, and if you're, if depending on the time horizon, you're investing in something uh, to not make any um, quick decisions based off of that. That would be my advice on, on that front. Yeah, I think I think that's good advice. I think um, in in terms of if if you're going to do, I guess do it yourself, if you're going to like just be kind of digging digging in and, and jumping into the, you know like a two hundred dollar kind of uh, fun like play uh, playing. One of the things that um, what was really I guess interesting for me is to expand beyond uh, the popular. Um, um, like the, the popular stocks that people talk about and look at actually like what vertical um, they're in. So for instance, like Tesla is doing amazing. Um, I didn't have enough money in that account to purchase any uh, Tesla stocks. However, um, there are companies and there's index funds that do a lot of stuff in terms of, um, you know, charging stations uh, for vehicles. And, and as we understand that electric vehicles are becoming, you know, more and more important, we know that governments are going to, you know, have mandated that um, in 2030, at least I think in Quebec, they're going to stop um, uh, selling uh, non-electric vehicles, right? So these decisions that are being made now, um, if you do have some money to invest, uh, of course, do your research about the company. I, I'm not just saying like pick any company that's kind of in those verticals, but those are for me at least areas of growth. Um, anything related to kind of innovation, green energy, we know that the world is has to make a shift towards these things. And uh, even like if you're not going to pick specific um, specific stocks themselves, if we're, if you're looking at portfolios, we'll consider doing uh, green portfolios or, or socially responsible portfolios and things like that that align kind of with your values and just your view about the world. Because I think when you do that, um, it doesn't matter if you know anything about stocks, if, if that decision feels good because you can align your values with it, um, I, th I think that's already good indication that it's, it's you know, it, it's going to, 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 to go somewhere for you. So um, that's kind of the approach that I, I guess it's more like go with your gut, but not entirely, but look at the context that we're in and it's try to anticipate where these things are going and anything around kind of innovation and, and like those types of things, there's companies are, are going to be needing it if, if you know, especially whatever happens after COVID, right? So. Yeah, and Carl, if I could add, add on to what you're saying, I, I think I think it was summarized in, in, in two points. One being, uh, if you're going to invest in individual stocks, maybe start with an industry you're, you're very, very interested in that you just naturally gravitated towards news around that industry or you have an interest in, right? And, and number two, instead of buying the individual stock, if, if that's your inclination, why not buy a basket of stocks through an index? So an example, if you are really into e-commerce, instead of buying um, the Shopify, even though Shopify has done really well, why don't you buy an index fund that covers all e-commerce tech companies in North America, whatnot, right? Because then it, then it, you're, you're buying into 
your your overall idea that e-commerce is going to go up and whatnot, but you're not betting on an individual player, um, so that you're you're likely to distribute that risk to the industry as opposed to the individual company. Yeah, definitely. Um, indexes are definitely really, really good in terms of it removes kind of the gambling aspect or the feeling of gambling when it comes to a lot of picking stocks. I guess for me, when it comes to getting news, I mean, I, I'm a little bit biased since I am in engineering and I am in software and machine learning. For me, naturally, like companies like I like, let's say we use buzzwords, like things like Snowflake that recently IPO. Um, I'm working at those companies or I'm interning at those companies. So for me, um, these companies, the news that I get from them is very like, I read a lot of TechCrunch, um, of course, like CNN Business, CNBC. I know they make CNBC, makes a lot of good YouTube videos. Um, so those are all really good to watch. Um, definitely for me, whenever it comes to buying stocks, um, trends is definitely one thing. So it's kind of looking in the long term, thinking, um, knowing what I know, looking at the articles that I know and kind of seeing where it will go, let's say electrical vehicles or e-commerce. Um, but then also for me, when it comes to buying stocks, I kind of have, I like kind of like having the mentality of going in, of if I'm assuming this is the money that I'm not kind of, kind of the 200 bucket where it's not money, I'm just gonna throw and see what happens with it. If it's money kind of I'm more serious with, um, let's say I buy just one stock or something, I treat that one stock as if I'm buying the entire company. So I treat that as if, okay, I'm gonna spend X amount of money um, on this whatever stock or this index fund. Or I, I guess this is more stock specific, specific stock specific. Uh, when buying it, I like to know everything about the company, like what they do, um, what the cash flow looks like, how do they get money, how do they lose money, what are their expenses, um, competitors. I generally like knowing. So if something goes bad, it's not like, oh, this is completely out of the blue, completely unexpected. So I kind of like knowing. Um, and then when it comes to like, let's say earnings, that's a kind of another wave of news that comes um, every quarter. Um, there's always earnings reports that basically just tells how um, tells everyone how the company's doing. So think of things like balance sheets, which tells like liabilities, assets, cash flow, like how they're getting money, how much, how much money they're spending, how much debt they have, things like that. And then general statements from the CEO. And then of course you have media speculation. So kind of every quarter, there's always the large amount of press articles released about different companies. Um, so that is always kind of a point where um, I always start looking at a lot of things, um, start thinking about different stocks to buy, potential opportunities like on a dip or something like that. But for me, generally, of course, when picking stocks, definitely treat it as if I'm buying the entire company. So I do care about um, like their business outlook, the risks, the risks they have. So I can understand those risks myself as a shareholder, even if I own, let's say, a millionth of a percent of the company. Um, for me, that's good information to just have, right? Since it is money that I'm spending and it's money that I could be spending on something else, like a hobby or on $5 coffee, you know? So um, <laughs> that is all very valuable to me, at least when it comes to news and as you're purchasing stocks. Yeah, thank you all very much for giving us lots of feedback and ideas. And I know I learned a lot. Um, I think I will keep buying my $5 coffee because that's my one joy in life. I'm trying to reduce as much as possible. So it's definitely work in progress. Uh, so I'm really delighted that you were able to join us and that you were able to share your knowledge, your time and your experience with us today. Um, I know I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone in this call learned it as well. Um, Takla, is there anything else you'd like to add? I just want to thank everyone as well for coming. This is the last part of my financial literacy series. So that for those of you that were there from day one, um, thank you so much. And, and those of course who also joined today, um, all our sessions are, have been recorded and, and posted to YouTube. So if you did miss any of them, uh, you can definitely have, you, you, you can have access to them and we could send out the link uh, via email. And this session is also being recorded and will be posted. Um, I guess the last thing I quickly wanted to say is um, we spend so much time working hard for our money. So uh, it's definitely not a bad, bad thing to spend some time to make sure we're managing it right. And um, I really hope that's, that's a big takeaway that you've taken from our sessions. Uh, and, and yeah, thanks to our guest speakers. Uh, very insightful information. And yeah, I guess that's, that's about it. Thank you yeah, for having you. us. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It was lovely meeting you all. And we will keep in touch virtually till we meet again in real life. <laughs> all right. Bye, guys. Take Bye, care. everyone. <laughs>